if you don't care about the distant future, if you don't care about faraway bands, uh, if you don't care about remote probabilities, uh, then you shouldn't care about climate change. Uh, you can sort of sum it up in one sentence, but yeah, obviously I'm not going to repeat the same sentence for the next three hours. We're going to make all these things uh, a good bit more precise. The conclusion follows immediately from the premise that is stated there as well, that climate change is a long-term problem, climate change is a global problem, and climate change is a fairly uncertain problem. Right? So the way we look at the far future versus the more near future uh, or versus today matters a lot. The way we look at what is happening to the rest of the world uh, other than our backyard uh, matters a lot. And also how we, our attitudes towards risk uh, and uncertainty matter quite a lot. I'm going to start with caring about the distant future and then the other elements will come into play uh, later. So, I've shown uh, this particular graph, this is the estimate of the social cost of carbon as a function of, or for free alternative pure rates of time preference, 3%, 1%, and 0%. And what you see is that if your utility discount rate is lower, then you care more about the future by definition, and therefore the, the good tax, the carbon tax that you want to impose is larger. If you focus on the median, it goes from 35 or so to a little bit about, about 50 for a 1% pure rate of time preference to 475 for a 0% pure rate of time preference. The lower your discount rate, the more you care about the future, the more you care about climate change, right? Which is a problem of the future. Now, what is a pure rate of time preference? I'm going to derive the Ramsey rule with you. Uh, the Ramsey rule is named after Frank, not Aaron uh, Ramsey. Frank was a professor of economics, Cambridge. He died at a very young age, uh, but despite that, made actually uh, some very profound contributions to economics, including uh, what I'm now going to do. By definition, the net present value of receiving one dollar or one pound or one euro in t years time from now equals absolute. The interest rates, continuous time interest rate in this case, just to make the uh, mathematics easier, is r. T is the time period, so we do e to the power minus r t. That is our discount factor, right? There is no understanding here. This is by definition. Well, you may not have seen this, right? You may be used to thinking in continuous time, where the discount factor is 1 over 1 plus r to the power t. And you may be used to thinking of r as the annual discount rate. But of course, if you have an annual discount rate, then you can also define a monthly discount rate and count time in the number of months that has passed rather than the number of years that have, or you can count time in the number of days that have passed rather than the number of months that have passed. And then what you would have is a lower discount rate per month or per day than you would have per year, but cumulative discounting, uh, you would get the same result in the end. You can also think of time in hours or in minutes or in seconds, and the discount rate would keep coming down, right? If you take the limit of that, if you keep making your time steps smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, then 1 over 1 plus r to the power t, for ever smaller time steps, t goes to e over e to the power minus rt, or 1 over e to the power rt. So we're working in continuous time because the math is actually easier, although the initial step looks a bit weird uh, to some people. So that is our discount factor. The value of receiving one dollar in t years time is e to the power minus r t, where t is the time period and r is our discount rate, and then your epsilon is your discount factor. The discount rate is actually an indifference principle. Really what you have is if indeed you choose to invest, if indeed you choose to put your money in the bank and you get a discount rate of R so that you can consume later. The fact that you do that sort of suggests that at this particular discount rate, uh, for this particular level of savings, you are indifferent between utility now and utility 
whenever you decide to take the money out of the bank. If you were not indifferent between the two, you could maximize your, you could increase your welfare without cost. So you're indifferent, otherwise your behavior would. So the indifference principle uh, is given here, which says that receiving a dollar later, what's the value of that? Well, you need to multiply that with the marginal utility. So this is the UBC to get from dollars to utils. And then you need to apply not the interest rate, but the utility discount rate. And the utility discount rate is just that you say utility later is less important than utility now. But if I have to choose between being happy today or happy tomorrow, I choose to be happy today. And the rate at which you make these trade-offs is this parameter a row. So this is the marginal value of receiving a dollar later. The marginal value of receiving epsilon dollar today is the epsilon, the amount of money you get, times the marginal utility evaluated uh, at today's point, U uh, sub C. So this is your indifference condition. Now, if this is true, then this is true, right? We just bring UC to the other side of the equation, right? We divide both sides by U uh, sub C. No secrets there. Then we assume constant a relative risk aversion. So U sub C is the UDC is C to the power minus eta, where eta is the curvature of your utility function. So this just follows from the CRA condition, or assumption, I should say. And then we need to make another step, because here we have our current consumption level. Here we have our future consumption level. If we assume that consumption grows at the rate gt, then ct is c0 times e to the power gt, but we need to raise it to the power minus eta, so we have a minus eta show up in front. So c cancels against c. Always good. c cancels against c, and what we have is that epsilon equals e to the power minus rho t minus eta gt. This is your indifference condition under CRRA. This was your definition of the discount rate, or the discount factor. So we have that e to the power minus rt equals e to the power minus rho t minus eta gt, or money discount rate r, the interest rate, equals the utility discount rate rho, or the pure rate of time preference, plus the curvature of the utility function eta times the growth rate of consumption G. This is the Ramsey rule. This is not an assumption. This follows from the structure of the problem. For those of you who don't like this sort of math, you can also do it graphically. So what do you do when you make a savings decision? Assuming that you're saving for a future richer self, which in your case is a valid assumption, right? You're poor students today. In a few months' time, uh, hopefully you'll have a job that pays much better than being a student. So you can assume rapid consumption growth, in the, or at least income growth in the future, in the near future, hopefully. So what do you do when you put a, a euro aside today? What do you do when you save for the future? You take money away from your current self, you take a euro away from your current self, and you're relatively poor at the moment, so that leads to a large welfare loss. This is a utility function, right? Consumption on this axis, utility on this axis. So you take away a dollar today that causes a welfare loss. And then in return, let's assume that the interest rate is zero. You get a, dollar, a euro in return at a later point. I mean, essentially what you do is you take a euro from your current poor self and you give it to a future richer self. The welfare gain of that, because you have grown much richer, is very tiny. So this is a silly thing to do. You incur a large welfare loss today in order to gain a small welfare gain in the future. Don't do that. Now, if the interest rate is large and positive, then you would have accrued interest on the dollar here, and it would become much larger, and then the subsequent or the consequent welfare gain will also be much larger. So what does the Ramsey rule do? So the relative size of the horizontal line here versus the horizontal line there is your money discount rate, your interest rate that you receive on your savings. And the Ramsey rule essentially says 
how large does that R need to be so that the horizontal line here equals the horizontal line there? That is essentially what is going on in the Ramsey rule. The question is, how much longer do we need to make this in order so that this welfare loss is the same part of what is inside as the welfare gain that you should get? That clear? That's the welfare accounting, right? That's the eta G. And then there's the row. The row just says, well, I don't care about being happier in the future. I want to be happy now. So the Ramsey rule, another way of looking at this, is that essentially it says we discount the future for two reasons. One, because we expect to be richer and therefore happier then. That's the eta G. G is the richer, eta G is the happier. So that is one reason to discount the future. The other reason to discount the future is that we're impatient. And the total reason to discount the future, the future measured in money, R, is the sum of the two components. Now, this derivation that I just did is all on the consumption side of things. That's actually not what Ramsey did. Ramsey did it in general equilibrium. If the capital market is in a dynamic equilibrium, then we have that the interest rate that consumers demand on their savings must equal the opportunity cost of capital, returns to the investment that uh, entrepreneurs get. So if you impose that, then you can derive the whole thing also on the production side uh, of the economy. Uh, I find the consumption side more intuitive because most of us are consumers rather than producers. The problem with the Ramsey rule as it is positive here is that it's hugely controversial. The problem with discounting in general is that it's hugely controversial. So on the one hand we have a more or less acceptable component to the Ramsey rule and Ramsey himself said yeah this is how it is, right? We get richer and therefore we get happier. Let's just stick to the richer in the future. It is a bit silly to take away money from somebody from your current poor self and give it to your future rich self. It just is a transfer that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So we should discount the future for the fact that we grow richer. Conceptually, that's undisputed. The derivation of the Ramsey rule, of course, hinges on assuming that we have a constant relative rate of risk aversion, which we don't, probably. So uh, that is an issue. I'll come back to that tomorrow. And there is, of course, also an issue uh, about how do we measure the growth rate of consumption. What do we actually mean by consumption? What is included there? Is it just our expenditure? Does it include consumption of intangibles and so on and so forth? Does it include our wealth and our interaction with our friends? Yes or no? Consumption is actually not necessarily easy to pin down. But really, and consumption here is defined as the consumption that enters into the utility function. So this should be the growth rate of the thing that enters into our utility function. And there's many things that enter into our utility function. So this is conceptually trivial, but actually in terms of measurement and actual implications, it's, it's, it's uh, a bit more controversial than it seems. And the big controversial bit is the row, the impatience. And Ramsey himself called this lack of imagination and other economists whose name I now forget have sort of written about the row and a positive row as sort of a symptom of lack of education. And it's the great unwashed who are uh, impatient but us noble economists are not. Goodman's the Nobel laureate also worked on this and railed against row being positive, right? I mean, actually his work showed that it should be positive but he was absolutely disgusted with his own uh, conclusion. Right? A lot of people say you cannot discount the future just because it is the future. The implications for climate change are obvious, right? Mm -hmm. That if we sort of pick a low pure rate of time preference, we care as much about future happiness as we care about today's happiness, then we can justify a lot of greenhouse gas emission reduction. <coughs> But if we uh, sort of pick 3% uh, pure rate of time preference, which is roughly in line with the discount rate that democratically elected governments use, that long-term investors use when, when they're trying to save for our pensions and so on and so forth, the market sort of seems to be saying, this is probably our pure rate of time preference, 
you want to justify large greenhouse gas emission reduction, you should perhaps go for a 0% pure rate of time preference. There are deep, deep questions here, right? So on the one hand, you may argue that discount rate is a preference parameter if we are talking about social policy and that social policy should be based on the preferences of the electorate. Ask people, you look at their savings behavior, you look at their investment behavior, you look at the investment behavior uh, of our uh, democratically elected governments, then you would find that the discount rate is actually fairly high. Three, four, five percent money discount rate in countries of the OECD, a pure rate of time preference of two, three, sometimes four percent. If you do that, then climate change largely disappears as a problem. And we can justify a small carbon tax, but not a large carbon tax. So some people have said, let's use a lower discount rate for climate change, which is a, a ridiculous solution. Why? Because the discount rate follows, if you follow the Ramsey rule or one of its variants, the discount rate follows from your structural parameters, your time preference, and your, the curvature of your utility function, the growth rate of your consumption. So you cannot just say, well, for problem A, my discount rate is this, and for problem B, my discount rate is that. That would just be a ridiculous thing to say. And you would lead to all sorts of repugnant conclusions. If you make the argument that the discount rate should be lower for climate policy than it is for other policies, then you come up with conclusions that are just not acceptable. So suppose we reduce uh, greenhouse gases, we invest uh, a million euros in debt, we reduce emissions uh, by a little bit, and as a result we save a single life in the year 2040. It's a benefit, right? But it's a future benefit, so it should be discounted. But it's a climate-related benefit, so it should be discounted by a little. Now, suppose that instead we spend that million euro in building a roundabout, and that makes bike travel safer, and as a result we avoid uh, a deadly accident in the year 2040. It's not a climate problem, right? So it's a future benefit, but it's not climate, so we should discount it a lot. So if you use different discount rates for different aspects of public policies, and essentially what you're saying is that one way of saving somebody's life is better than another way of saving somebody's life? Try to tell that to the victim's family of the victim of the road accident. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make moral sense. It doesn't make any economic sense. So you cannot just say, look, climate is different, so we use a different discount rate. That's just a silly solution. And in all our other applications of public policy, we use a relatively high discount rate, which would suggest that also for climate policy, we should use a relatively high discount rate. Or should we? Because on the one hand, we want to be consistent across policy. On the one hand, we want to be sort of consistent with people's uh, savings behavior and investment behavior. But at the same time, sort of saying everything that happens more than 100 years into the future is not important. That's also not a conclusion that we want to draw. So the question is, is there a solution to this? Can we come up with a form of discounting that is sort of consistent with the behavior that we observe in the short term, but at the same time is consistent with caring about the long-term future? And the answer is yes, yes, or yes, where it's or. There's three contenders there, um, since we're squaring uh, this circle. And the first one is so-called hyperbolic discounting, and this comes out of behavioral economics. Our conventional way of discounting the future, using exponential discount rates, has on the one hand a very desirable, desirable property, and on the other hand has a very strange property. And actually the properties are the same. Depending on how you look at it, it can be strange or desirable. Normally what we say is that our discount factor is e to the power minus rho times the passes of time. That's our conventional exponential discount or geometric discount. And exponential and geometric are just this different words for the same thing, depending on what flavor of mathematics you adhere to. So this is our conventional exponential discount. Now, what is the relative distance between two years in the future, where the two years in the future are separated by delta? Well, if you look at the time t plus delta, this is our discount vector, e to the power minus rho t plus delta, versus looking at t years into the future, e to the power minus rho t, you take the ratio of the two, what happens? t 
Steve drops out of the equation. The relative weight of two years into the future only depends on the distance between those two years. This implies time consistency. This means that the sheer passage of time is no reason to change your behavior. If we don't impose this particular condition, we are immediately time inconsistent. But it's also very strange. So that time consistency is desirable, but it's also very strange. Essentially what you're saying is the relative weight to between a gain in the year 10 and the year 11 is the same as the relative weight of a gain in the year 100 and the year 101, or a year 1,000 and 1,001, because the only thing that matters is the distance in years between the two years. The T drops out. That's not how you think. It's much more logical, much more intuitive to think that the relative distance between the year 10 and the year 11 is the same as the distance between the year 100 and 110, or 1,000 and 1,100. When you look at the relative distance between the shapes, rather than, I mean, the year 3,000 and the year 3,001, it's the same to us, right? 2017 is not the same as 2018, but the year 3000 is the same as the year 3001, right? It's far, far in the distance future, right? It's like your great, 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 children, right? What are talking about? There is a lot of experimental evidence. There is a lot of observational evidence that people do not use exponential discounting but instead do something uh, as follows. That really what matters is the relative distance between the two years in the future, rather than the absolute distance. And one way of doing that is just sticking a log in. Then we're immediately time inconsistent, but it seems to be, at least to some approximation, how people think. And as I said, there's experiments after experiments, a lot of observational data that look into this. And one anecdote, a friend of mine uh, got a heart attack, thought he had only 10 minutes left to live, and he was really, really craving for living this additional minute, and he was willing to pay anything for this one additional minute, hoping that uh, he could see his family for just a little bit longer. Whereas for you guys, I mean, you're healthy, one additional minute, who cares, right? So depending on your time horizon, depending on your perspective, depending on how far you look into the future, actually the additional time matters quite a bit. We see this, for instance, also in the willingness to pay of older people to prolong their lives versus younger people to prolong their lives. We see the same thing that the less time you have left to live, the more you are willing to pay to extend it by a year versus younger people. So this is one way of tracking it. For, for the economic purist, it's purely ad hoc, right? It comes, falls out of the data. There is no theory, no axioms. It's just like we put people in the lab, we ask them questions, and this is what they tell us. We observe how people invest in health care, and this is what pops out. But it does square the circle, right? Because essentially what you say here is that your discount rate falls as you peer further into the future. And yes, you discount steeply in the beginning, but as you move further and further out, your discount rate falls with the time horizon. And that immediately implies that you put a greater weight on long-term problems. So that is one solution to squaring the circle. The second looks at heterogeneity, looks at uncertainty. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow morning. And the third does it axiomatically, and I'm also going to look at that tomorrow morning. Okay, I'll see you guys then.